put this on. Allow me to rig you. <laughs> That's for the camera. Yeah. Great. Um, so, <clears throat> just like they say on, on the airplanes, uh, this session is OLPC, which is one lab per child, Kenya, deployments. So those are the three things we're going to be talking about today. Um, if you're here to, for uh, Koji, uh, Python, and recursive procedures, this is not the session. Um, I'm, a, I'm a rookie to uh, FSOS. Mark is, a, a, is a, the, uh, the veteran. Uh, and he will do, be doing the, the first part of the presentation. It's, uh, we were asked by, uh, by Chris Tyler to, to come in and he said there's very, an eclectic audience at, at FSOS. Um, so we're, we're kind of hoping for that. Uh, our story is a story of a very successful use of free and open source software and hardware um, in the most remote areas of the world. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tr transfer it over to Mark to do the, uh, um, the first part of it and then I'll talk a little bit about some of the techie stuff that goes on. Uh, Mark is a, f uh, a former uh, director of uh, uh, head of digital media at uh, Upper Canada College here in Toronto. Uh, this project was started by him and actually my son uh, had, as a project for inner city kids in Toronto. Uh, that was the pilot project It then moved on to be uh, an international deployment project in Kenya uh, and has been run out of uh, some of the major schools in Toronto and it's carrying on and we just got back from another large technical conference of open source at uh, San Francisco State University. We just got back uh, Sunday uh, from that. So I'm going to turn it over to the professional presenter, the teacher in the group. So, so, so this is where the presentation gets terrible. Um, <laughs> First of all, oh, there we go. Um, I, I did want to start by thanking uh, Chris Tyler um, because really much of what we're doing wouldn't have been possible if it hadn't been a fortuitous meeting with him uh, up here a couple of years ago. Uh, we had already been working with the uh, OLPC XO, uh, but we hadn't been connected to the larger organization, OLPCLaptop.org, um, or to the sugar community. Uh, the open source uh, software which is loaded on every XO until I came up here to the conference and, and met some people from OLPC uh, with Chris. So it was a great opportunity for us and it, it forwarded us forward. Um, as Kevin said, I mean we're, we're here to show you a bunch of things but I, I, I really, I asked him on the way up in the car this morning, you know, what should be the main takeaways um, and we didn't exactly know who the audience would be, you know, your individual roles, but I thought I would say this. Um, one of the messages I have is that there's enormous amounts of really interesting stuff happening in Africa and specifically in Kenya uh, to do with technology and I'm sure that many of you already know that but I thought I'd reiterate that because you know the only messages we get through the Globe and Mail are when a bomb goes off or some you know pirates steal a tourist um, and we have not been stolen yet so we've been very lucky. Um, second of all uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the effects that the work that you do as uh, open source programmers and engineers, you know, what's the, what's the strangest endpoint for the work that you're doing? Where can it possibly end up? And I'm going to show you a picture in a moment of uh, uh, a school where the principal of the students and the teachers hike to the top of a volcanic mountain and put a wireless antenna uh, for a 3G signal up in a tree and sit on volcanic rocks while the goats walk by so that they can access their email and chat with us live. Um, that's the end point of some of this. Um, I also wanted uh, to leave you with just a sense, I mean I know you're doing it already because you're in the open source community, but the power of volunteerism, uh, the, the power of self-aggregating groups and what we've come to call uh, do-it-yourself, point-to-point, peer-to-peer development. Instead of going through a large organization, you do it yourself. You find a place in the world that you love, that you think needs uh, development and where they want that development and you work hand-in-hand -hand to do it yourself. And as Kevin alluded to, this program began. I guess I started working with his son uh, when his son was in grade six. Um, and he was a tech kid who needed to be put to work doing some fun stuff. And when he was in grade eight, we organized to get one of these so that he could play with it. Uh, in grade nine, uh, after the summer of grade nine, we had 40 of them and we ran an inner city program. Uh, and we took a portable lab on the road. And Adam was 
14 at the time, I think. He programmed an Apache server into one of our machines. I mean, I didn't know even how to turn the machine on, and we uh, were able to stream out information traveling around uh, the city. And that ultimately became a group of four kids who went to Kenya at age 15 and 16. Uh, I was their leader, but I knew nothing at all. I was just the pretty face. Um, don't laugh. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and I'll get to a moment where we are now. Uh, we have become, in some ways, a regional development force, and I think a, a part of a global development force, and it was done on the backs of uh, 14, uh, 15 and 16-year-old students. So I'm promoting child labor as well. Um, this is being recorded. I was being ironic. Uh, so uh, just to catch you up, um, there we Carly, go. Carly, uh, specialist in music and teaching music. This is our intern, Simon, who you'll hear a little bit more about. Um, this is Amal Chandaria, an, an expert in many, many things, uh, but also in uh, blogging and photography and teaching. Um, this is Matthew Walker, uh, who, is, uh, who set up the music program that his brother took over. Uh, this is Jim Walker, their father, who came over after two of his sons had been because he wanted to know what the heck was going on all the way over in Kenya. And this is the other Walker's son, um, and this is Richard Walker, and his push has been art. Uh, Adam's uh, wife, oh, sorry, this is an old slide. Ah, I, there should be a picture of Adam's wife, Vicky, here as well. Um, and she worked on a program with Richard called Drawn to School, where kids learn art, and they do paintings, and then people contribute school fees for their students, and that's going really well. Um, and this is Connor Samowski. Uh, who is also kind of an all-around tech genius and blogger photographer. Um, so this is our group. Uh, it, as I said, it started with four high school students and me, um, and now it's grown to encompass really all of the families. We're now at two schools, a secondary school called Intugi Day Secondary School. It's a district day mixed school, which puts it uh, kind of low on the totem pole of schools, where most of the schools are provincial, private, uh, and single sex. Uh, but it's a very beautiful school. It's about 250 students right now, and we're at the Laparwa Primary School, which is in the Ilinguesi uh, Maasai territory. Uh, and we're at really at six sites. We're at the schools, but we're also at an education center at the Lewa Wildlife Conservancy, who's our partner on the ground there. Uh, they have a huge wildlife conservancy uh, that focuses on all of the animals you would know from Africa, uh, what they call the Big Five, uh, but also uh, primarily on uh, the rhinos, the black and white rhino, uh, elephants, and gravy zebras. Um, we have two uh, local heroes, which is what we call our representatives on the ground. One is our friend Godfrey, who teaches geography and is the tech supervisor now at uh, Intugi. And the other is our new intern, Simon, who was the head boy at the school and graduated uh, a year ago. So these are just some pictures to give you a sense of where we are. Um, this is actually on site at Antugi Secondary School. Uh, we stay when we're over there at the Lewa Wildlife Conservancy in little pup tents. And this is our communal space. And the kids are here uh, you know, putting together, trying to get our solar power working and putting together a computer. Um, it's also where we discovered that if you plug a soldering, one of those little single soldering irons directly into the power, it uh, blows up precipitously uh, if it doesn't have a little brick adapter. So that happened soon after this photograph was taken. Um, this is our first trip, uh, sorry, second trip over there uh, with the students. And you can see this is the entire school of uh, Intugi Secondary. And this is a mall with some of our original solar panels. Uh, we took over initially eight laptops and eight panels in a suitcase. But we hadn't considered, we tested everything out in the lab um, with some little bulbs and we took them out in the Canadian winter and everything seemed to be working fine. Mm -hmm. And I told the kids that they should check online to see if there were any problems and of course we were all overconfident. We did not check online. We got over there in Kenya the first time to experiment with this deployment and when we arrived um, the, the fact that we were 2,000 meters in the air uh, and we were at the equator caused them to overcrank the computers and shut down uh, the electrical system of the computer. So. Uh, it never occurred to us that there might actually be a local solution in Kenya where there are lots of solar power. And it turned out uh, in our panic, they got, kids got on Google. And there was this wonderful man, Joel, who was like 20 miles down the road and was like, oh, you fools. Uh, 
didn't you realize you would need an inverter, a controller, a battery supply? And he came out with his workers, and, uh, and Adam and Derek helped erect this kind of umbrella. Uh, they welded it together on site from our eight little things. And it's still standing there in spite of the storms and the rain, uh, generating a trickle of power. But we have subsequently put in a big solar array with Joel, who knows what he's doing. Um, so um, just to give you a sense of how quickly Kenya is developing, this is the school five years ago. I mean, that's the whole school. Uh, now uh, the school, as you'll see, has an MBA-sized basketball court and concrete. Uh, they have a music program. They have an art program. They have 40 laptops. Uh, they have solar power. Um, I mean, they're fully developed as a school um, using a SIM card through a portable wireless router and some permanent wireless routers uh, to bring an internet signal. Um, but you can see it's growing. This is now their kind of storage facility for firewood. But uh, it gives you a sense of the, the speed with which the school is developing. Um, the kids who initially went made this video um, several years ago. And I thought it would give you a sense of their initial experience. I'm the guy in the back in the gray shirt. Can you guys I'm hear that at all? I'm 15 years old, and I'm teaching at a secondary school in Isiolo, a region of northern Kenya. Huh? If we could hook up to the sound system, that, that would be great. Sorry, I didn't realize that that was. Then it should be set up, and then the volume is on the screen. Ah, good. Here we go again. Uh, can tests? No sound. More. Yeah. More. 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 Perfect. <laughs> Uh, so, this is, uh, so this is a video that Connor and Amal did, and it won the National Middle School Association video contest. Um, but it got on YouTube, and it got a remarkable number of hits, and suddenly this tiny school in northern Kenya became kind of uh, world famous in some circles, which was kind of interesting to all of us. Um, this is about three minutes long. Hi, my name is Amal. I'm the guy in the back in the gray shirt. I'm 15 years old, and I'm teaching at a secondary school in Isiolo, a region of northern Kenya. Hi, my name is Connor, and I'm the guy on the right in the blue shirt. I'm also 15 years old, and Amal and I are with two other students from our school in Toronto, Canada. With our teacher, we brought eight OLPC laptops and taught the students how to use them. Before we go into any more detail, let's rewind back a bit. At the beginning of ninth grade, we used the OLPCs in our computer engineering class. We began to think, what if we took these computers to students around the world? Mark Badley, the head of digital media at our school, proposed that we go to Kenya during March break, where we would bring some of the laptops to a school called Ntugi Day Secondary School. We would teach the students about the OLPCs, but we also hoped to learn about the students' culture. Before going, we had to find a way to charge the laptops and to also connect them to the internet. Since solar energy was the only practical option for power, we researched different types of panels and eventually chose a brand to use. Next, we did some research and realized that we might be able to deliver wireless internet to the school via a cell phone signal. Safaricom, Kenya's largest phone company, provides coverage all over Kenya. We had the idea of using one of their USB modems to bring the internet to the school. That worked, but we still needed a way to use the signal from a single Safaricom SIM card to create a wireless network for the entire school. That's where CradlePoint and their amazing portable wireless technology came in. We used CradlePoint routers in conjunction with the Safaricom modems to bring the internet to the OLPCs. Furthermore, CradlePoint even agreed to send us free units for use at the school. When we arrived, the solar panels weren't charging the OLPCs. With the assistance of Joel, a local solar contractor, we combined the eight panels into one big panel, which was able to power not only the laptops, but also the cradle point units. We also installed the batteries that the laptops could charge overnight, and a charge controller to regulate the current flowing into the battery. Before we arrived at the school, we were worried that the students wouldn't respond well to our lessons, since we're younger than most of them. Once we arrived, we met our first class. We brought out the laptops, but the students were intimidated and didn't want to try them. Eventually, a few people began to start using them, and shortly, everyone was having fun on the laptops. 
We eventually taught every student in the school how to use the laptops and access the internet, and we encouraged them to join the new computer club. Here, they could learn more about the laptops and pass their knowledge on to others. After we left, the school was even able to create their own website about school events and news. It's now been seven months, and Tugi has 20 laptops. They're using them in their classes, and some of the students even have their own Facebook pages. The trip was really great because the learning was mutual, as we learned about each other's lifestyles and cultures. We hope that we have shown you how we made a world of difference, but also how the world has made a difference to us. So, um, as was clear in this video, uh, at the time the students were students at Upper Canada College downtown. Uh, they were in grade 10 and grade 11. Uh, they were all kids who had shown a, a deep interest in uh, computers and in programming uh, and also in the ideas of educational development. And they uh, were working with the, the then head of computer science and head of science, Kevin Olds, uh, and had taken his course and he had used the EXO as a platform for just a Linux course. I mean, it was a cute computer that they could tear apart uh, and rebuild. Uh, but, but, and then they could learn the Sugar software, but then they could just strip the computer down and, and use it as a platform for programming, which they did. Um, and so kind of they were a hand-picked group, and we went over, not, none of us had ever, you know, really been to Kenya. I'm all had been there with his parents once, but we didn't know what we were doing, and we hoped that things went well. Uh, we never could have predicted uh, what would happen. Um, these are some of the students of Intugi. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about uh, in a few minutes is the way that we're trying to build uh, a local hierarchy of skills uh, and of incentives there. Uh, this is Judy. Uh, Judy has graduated from the school. Uh, she went back to get her marks up and we hope that she'll be our next intern. Um, this is Phineas, the current principal of the school. And the principal that you saw in the video is Jacob, uh, who's doing his PhD now. Um, the Several of the teachers used, initially used the computers to complete uh, their degrees, their master's degrees to do research and uh, to work online. The initial use of the computers was in the National Science Congress, which is a big deal in Kenya. Every school participates. And the first year these kids got into the National Science Congress for the first time, they got into the provincials beyond the district level. Uh, the next year they came first, second, and third in the district and moved on to the provincials and ended up in the top 10. And then the third year, uh, the, the high achievement came down a bit, but all eight groups got past the district level. Um, since the computers were instituted, they've gone, Kevin, correct me if I'm wrong, from 17th to 8th to 3rd in the district uh, as a school. And literally the first year that the computers were installed, the intake to the grade eight class doubled in size. So they had two classes instead of one as an intake. So 80 kids instead of 40. And now the school is virtually doubled in size as those students have moved through the school. Um, so now they have 40 XOs. And you can see Joelle's uh, solar panel uh, up here. The video made it seem so clean, like, oh, and then we found Joelle. It didn't show us kicking the solar panels and the stuff around in fury at our own ignorance. Uh, there was a whole day of that. Um, this gives you a sense of some of the programs that have been developed. Uh, solar powered keyboard. Um, and now they uh, pipe in the national anthem for the flag rising at assemblies outside. Um, we've also used Vernier data sensors, USB data sensors, which work with the XOs. Uh, temperature sensors, uh, pH sensors, turbidity sensors. Uh, this is an experiment with the pH sensor. And that's Walter, uh, the chemistry teacher. Uh, we even set up uh, Kevin Olds at Upper Canada College, set up an experiment so that they could test gravity and compare gravity in Toronto to gravity uh, on the slopes of Mount Kenya using a little uh, pen laser and a speed sensor. Uh, Kevin and his son, Adam, have really pioneered the use of USB microscopes. Kevin, how, how expensive are these? Um, depending on, for those of you who are in this space, <coughs> there's a lot of stuff that doesn't have, doesn't have drivers. So we, in order to get this thing to work first time, every time we have to go with a UVC compliant uh, microscope, 
Um, and if we want to go to 400 times level, um, the, the bottom end price you can get those is about $45 each. Um, in general, the actual brand name of it is called Miho Z Star VMS004. And if you go on eBay to get that, it'll cost you $89. However, if you type in all the specs of it, you'll get the one which is exactly the same from China at $39. Now, the only difference is it doesn't say Miho on the side of the box, but it is the same one. The, the problem with a lot of the gadgets that we that we use is um, uh, we're very fortunate and we have a, a, a gentleman named Daniel Drake who reports basically with nobody except minus store roles as to the stuff he does in the kernel. So we call him, we say, we've got this, it doesn't work, and we say, he says, send it to me, and then he sends it upstream and it gets done. So we, we, that's a really nice thing, but yeah, 40 bucks is the minimum. $10 this was the only microscope uh, before we got there, and you can see that actually providing a cheaper solution that works with the laptops is, is really a good option. Um, just to be clear, these schools generally don't have very many books uh, or texts, um, so access to resources is really tough. And for kids doing a science congress uh, who want to do research, for teachers who are trying to make their, uh, you know, their curriculum better, it is very hard. And initially, we really brought the laptops over just as access to the internet because we figured with Wikipedia, and we also have a Wikipedia on a stick, uh, that this would be a big boon. And it was really a trade-off. Everyone thinks that books are the answer, but books rot and they're heavy. They're hard to ship, and you can rip out pages and they disappear. Uh, we've actually had better success with the integrity. We've lost, we've broken two computers out of 40 over three years. Um, so this is their website. They maintain it and run it. Um, Godfrey is the webmaster. Um, one of the families that came over uh, decided that uh, basketball was such a popular activity at the school that they funded an NBA-sized concrete basketball court. Uh, unintended consequences. Now it's hard to get the kids to play any sport other than basketball. They love it. And uh, they burned a lot of their bandwidth downloading LeBron James videos because they wanted to learn. I mean, honestly, LeBron James is a god at the school. That's all you hear about when you're there. Um, the, one of the surprising things um, was the effect of the laptops on the sports because the coaches could research stuff. Um, so the next steps right now, we're running three pilot projects. Uh, one at the La Parwa School, and I'll just I'll show you very quickly a picture of that. Uh, an education center at Lewa with 12 laptops, and then Simon has a backpack kit with four laptops and a portable wireless router that he takes to three other schools, four other schools that are on the list for subsequent development. And Kevin has some machines in stock that we're waiting to deploy. Um, these are some of the kids at La Parwa and one of the teachers at an adjacent school. Hi, Madhu. I hope you are fine, and we are looking forward to meet you as you come on July. And we are very much happy to hear that you are coming back and interact with us more again. We are in a position to learn all about what you have planned for us, and we are able uh, to put it also into practice. The music that you have taught, you have taught us, we are still uh, using it even in playing the chorus in our assemblies, and the assembly, the, the flag racing assembly has been made very lively through the use of these uh, decorators. I hope you come and see the troop, sing it, and uh, I think that will uh, be very happy for to even have it with you. Uh, concerning the band button and the jargon that you taught the students, we are having more students having an uh, interest in it, and they are enjoying the jargon, and uh, I will practice few more, and I think as you come, you will see them the way they are doing, and I think you will also be happy uh, concerning uh, it. We have got even our new uh, computer lab, which is just under construction, and we are hoping that as you come, you'll be able to meet us already settled there and see the way we are going on on it. It is going to reduce our computer literacy in our school, and we are very hope, grateful uh, for that. Um, as you come, we are wishing uh, you all the best as you prepare, and also in your studies, as you continue with them, we are only saying that God will bless you and help you achieve more of your goals even in life. We are looking very fun to meet you again as you come. And also greet me other group members and tell them that we are also missing them very much and again looking forward that one day you meet them. So I just bid you goodbye as I leave and wish to meet you next time. Goodbye. So that was Simon as head boy. So I'm going to conclude that was a year uh, and that was a year ago, June. Simon had never presented in front of a camera before. 
and in fact, he did a presentation and we uploaded it and he was going so fast uh, because we told him to keep it to three minutes uh, and he just compressed it. So this was his <laughs> second shot at it. He became, in two takes, he became very adept in front of the camera, uh, did a beautiful job, uh, and became an expert in the computers. Uh, I just want to show you, uh, as Kevin comes up here, a brief clip of Simon this summer, a year and a half later, as our intern, who is now an expert public speaker, a brilliant teacher, uh, and a great representative for us, and is really the connective tissue between our deployments. So let me just, I'll just pop it up as a preview. This is the raw footage. Um, Uh, there he, this is him. And I'll show you just very briefly a shot of him in the full classroom uh, working the room. That is his second day teaching at a school which is very remote from where he is. Uh, it's a Maasai school, and he is uh, Kimeru, and uh, from a school that's Kimeru and Kikuyu. So he is on unusual territory, had never been to the school before, uh, had never been into the Ilinguesi territory, and was taking control of our program. So I hope that gives you a sense of kind of the learning curve, both of our students here in Toronto, but also of the students in Kenya. Um, so, Kevin? Do you want me to run anything in the back there? No, that's fine. Hi, I don't have the uh, fancy, uh, fancy graphics behind me here. Um, what I thought I would, would share with you is, is some of the um, planning and the frustrations we went into. When, when my son first came home to me and said, uh, I've got this little computer and I want to run such and such on it. I went, really? How do you do that? The, the original X01 um, had built into it an 8021S, which is a mesh network, hardware mesh support for the wireless. And it, it was very, very long range. Like, we we're talking from St. James Park, which is now, I guess, the center of Occupy Toronto, uh, all, the way to, all the way to the island. Um, by, by stepping people X apart, they could all become part of the same mesh. The disadvantage with that, with that setup was that it, it can't route. So they couldn't get to the internet at the same time they could mesh. So we, they would have to join an access point. So what we started to see is we've got a, really lo a lot of really neat technology, um, but we really haven't dis determined what the application is. So we sat down and we did the, all, all the boring stuff. So we went through and sat down with Mark and sat down with Kevin Olds and sat down with my son and said, what's the use case? What do we want to be able to do? What is it that we want to do? So we said, for this particular program, what we want to do is we want to use the mesh. The mesh is the most important thing. So that's when Adam went over and downloaded the whole LAMP stack and put, it, put the Apache server on so everybody could share and collaborate. The use case for Kenya is completely different. That there, there was, the stuff wasn't there. We needed to be able to go to the internet. And what they've said, and what was really kind of neat is how two years ago this was an amazing piece of technology, this local, local Wi-Fi thing. And now, like, everybody's kind of got it. But we're still using uh, the cradle point technology. And the reason we use the cradle point technology is because it is bulletproof. And unfortunately, it's not open source. <laughs> it uses something called Ypipe, which is their own software. It's not, it's not like Windows based, but it's their own interface going into it. Uh, we tried the Buffalo, and it, it, it just doesn't react well in these kinds of situations. And the, the really, the situation that we're talking about is the ability to run on its own battery. Like this has its own lithium ion battery inside. So we can take this, as we said, up top into, into horrifying magnetic dust. Like I'm telling you, as soon as we turn that on, it's red. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the things with the buffaloes are, they, they just don't react well in those kind of situations. They're not bulletproof. So we, we had to say to ourselves, okay, we're gonna go with this. Um, and I think I could, it's safe to say that 
the flames that were thrown our way on the forums when he said we, when he said we were using this instead of that was kind of weird. So that's uh, one, one of the things. The other thing is that we also have um, a company called Techion, um, which we've partnered with as well. And these are very large capacity uh, lithium ion batteries. And they're, they're controlled and you can pick whichever voltage you want, uh, anywhere from five to 12 volts. Um, and then you can put the second pack on it. These things link together, they charge together, and they also, you can plug the solar blanket into the battery. And what we found as well through the deployment is charge the batteries and then run from the batteries. Don't try to charge and run at the same time. The engineers in the audience might know why better than me, but we have, we have pure proof that when you charge and run at the same time, you get less time on the end, and I, I'm not exactly sure why that is. It could have something to do with the EC that's on the, on the machine itself, or it could have something to do with just the way that it's, it's distributing its load. Techion, uh, T-E-K-K-E-O-N. Um, they, uh, they were very, very helpful to us, and as I said, they got the little things that link them together, and then they're great. And they're, these things, again, we chose these because the the other corresponding product didn't have the ability that when you unplugged it, like this guy, sorry, wherever I put it, uh, likes five volts. These like 12. The other competitive product, if you leave it at 12 and you plug this in, it's dead. Whereas this, every time that you take the contact point out, it resets to five. So it was just one of those things, when you choose what it is you want to do, make it bulletproof. Um, one of the things that we talked about um, when we were doing it is why am I involved? And I, I run a, the, the technical operation of a very large payroll service and uh, accounting company. Uh, and so I always like to be able to sleep at night. So me sleeping at night means that it's what we call in the trade dial tone. Every time I pick it up, I want it to work. Every time I hang it up, I want it to turn off. That's the kind of quality I want. So. I got given the job of making this deployment dial zone, or some people use the metaphor of it as a, a toaster instead. It just works every time. So that's what we started to choose. What we found out was, okay, this, this little beastie, that, this can handle up to about five or six stations coming on it at once. You can boost it. You can, it's got some, some nice uh, optimization algorithms in it that, that we can use, but 40 laptops, what do we do with 40? So they have another device, um, the next one up, which is not battery powered, that we could use within, within the workstations and then use that as a satellite. So we could set up a, our little WDS so we could do all that kind of stuff on, on those. Um, these are not cheap. These are about $175 each. So then, we, then I would kick it back to Mark and say, okay, what we need more than anything else right now is funding. So, <laughs> so we go. Yeah, so that, that's, that's uh, Huawei is a very big in Kenya, this company, Huawei. They're, they're huge, like the, the Safaricom used them a lot. Uh, one of the nice things about, uh, uh, was that the 3G HSDPA network in Kenya is significantly better than Rogers. So, <laughs> and, and it's not for under, under use, and I can tell the story of Mark. The, the, every Maasai shep herder in the world has a 3G phone. <laughs> right, like they are in some ways so far ahead of us. You go in there with the with the blinders, the, the Western blinders on. These guys, I go to uh, Nisa's brother, and he says, "Oh, we need Nisa to come and, and do something for us." He goes, "Okay, well." He texts him, and Nisa says, "Well, it's going to cost a hundred shillings." So he texts him a hundred shillings, and you're sitting there going, "What? We, we, we don't even. We're just, just starting in Canada. And their whole Safaricom infrastructure. They use something called M-Pesa." which is they take 100 shillings, take it into the corner store. The corner store then texts them 100 shillings on their phone, and away they go. And then when they're going to go buy something, they text the 100 or the 10 shillings or whatever, and it's all done. And we talked to Michael Joseph about it, and he said, Why, how did you guys get this? Because we have no banks. There's nobody holding us back. There's nobody who's protecting their service fees. <laughs> There's no credit cards. They don't carry wallets. It's, it's, everything's on the cell phone. But we had the situation where we were watching a, a documentary, Milking the Rhino, uh, which is a, a group of, uh, of a, a documentary on empowering the Maasai tribe themselves to run their own nature reserves. And one of the things that happened, we were in this huge, it's like on uh, Bloor Street, the Bloor Cinema, 
And the, the Maasai guy is there with his leg up, red, traditional red stuff, reaches into his pocket, clicks up the clamshell. The audience laughs. You know, like, what are you laughing at? You know, like, <laughs> this, this, is, this is their life. He tells people the dust storm's coming. He tells people where the water is. He tells people the, the goat's gone. They, they, they actually really are technologically pretty good. And as I said, the big thing was all, of the, all the testing we did on these little guys here in Toronto, the throughput was way better in Kenya than it was in Toronto. So that was, that was a, a really pleasant surprise. One of the other things we found out, um, these USB sticks, not good. <laughs> these USB sticks, very good. <laughs> Why? Because they're covered in rubber. They can be out in the rain. The dust doesn't get into them. Other thing, um, bad manufacturers of USB and SD cards, they're everywhere. Um, th th we have everything on the, on the technology, on the XOs, is if you want to save it, it has to go to an external device if you're not using a school server. You want to make sure that you've got something that can be written many, 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 many times. So you have to do your research on the, on the forums as to say, okay, which, which are the ones that have the right number of erase blocks? Which are the numbers of the ones that have a, a good throughput? They have SD card capabilities as well. Again, we found out that micro SD, SanDisk, four gigs, Real good. Kingston Travelers, crap. <laughs> so um, you, you, you run into those things, you have to, a successful technical deployment, you have to do it and do the crap out of it. Okay. Do we have a story? Um, this, with the USB key, uh, the one problem we ran into that we didn't anticipate, we took them to a car lab, and one of the kids had it in his mouth, so we couldn't do it, and thought it was a piece of candy, and was about to swallow it, literally. So we had to explain the whole function of the USB key. Because they were orange and gorgeous. Another nice thing. That's a solar panel. Uh, 18 watt. It's very nice. You have pictures of people like wearing them on their back as they're going up the hill charging their cell phones. Uh, 18 watts is kind of good enough to charge um, the battery for this guy. Uh, we have roll up mats for charging these guys. And even that with the roll-up mat, is, uh, is, it takes about six and a half hours to fully charge that battery um, with a decent size. And again, not cheap. Um, the $25 solar panels, as of like two weeks ago, weren't that great. Uh, they're getting better every day. They're getting cheaper every day. All you want to make sure is that you can wash them. Uh, one of the things you have to worry about with solar panels is the film itself, the photovoltaic film itself. If it, again, if you're in a dusty environment, this is why we keep arguing with the OLPC people about why we don't want tablets, because <laughs> there won't be anything left of the screen by the end of the day. Like this, this metaphor is great. For those of you who haven't seen an XO, this is an XO 1.5. I can tell because it says so in red magic marker on the end of it. <clears throat> this one is an XO 1.75. And this is an XL1. The XL1 uh, was a, is a, a, uh, an AMD geode processor, 256 megs, uh, and about uh, of, of main memory and uh, one gig of, of hard drive, which is actually a micro SD card. The 1.5 went to a, uh, a, a different processor, um, uh, which is, is no longer manufactured, um, so they're kind of not doing that anymore. But it brought us into one gig of main memory and into the ability of, of four gigs of, uh, of random access as well. And that was on a micro SD card. Um, what we found is that as, as developers started to develop for this platform, um, on the VIA processor, on this platform, we, were, we sort of ran out of the ability to run on this guy. So then we went, well, okay, what, what can we possibly do? And so we went to, out, to the, out to the forums and um, I, for those of you in the open source, please forgive me, but I, I don't ever want to hear, why should I do your homework? <laughs> That's just not right. You know, I, I'm, I'm trying to protect the deployment or, or find, get some information. I, I, what I've told all the people that we work with as well in, in, in open source is, um, if you don't want to answer the question, don't answer the question. If you don't want to help, don't help. Uh, but the, the flaming or the, it's not my homework. I, I, I really, I, a bunch of kids who want to use this thing. What came back was swap. 
So that's what we did, is we, on this little sucker here, there's a little SD card slot. So what we were able to do, and, th and then, uh, gosh, how many, how many arguments did expert A, expert B, uh, about how to do that? Like, uh, the, the cards themselves are formatted FAT32 out of the, uh, out of the manufacturer. And the FAT32, the SD formatter utility, which runs on that awful Windows system, actually really protects the SD cards well. It keeps the erase blocks on the front, it keeps the usage at the back to be, to be right. And it, that formatting, that native formatting is great. What you then want to do is uh, use a partition manager like uh, Gparted or something on the Linux side and make Linux swap. And so we tested all different kinds of environments, like having a file, a swap file on the card or having an ext3 or an ext4 file system on it. The problem with journaling filing systems is because you don't want to write that often, it writes everything twice, right? That's the essence of journaling. So you don't want to do that. So it ends up that a small, two times the amount of RAM size Linux swap file is optimal. And we've, well, outside of them getting, falling out of the bottom of them and disappearing into people's pockets, they don't fail. So. That's, it's it's, it's kind of nice, so we've done that. So that's that one, that's that one. Okay, the new one, the new guy on the block, which as you can tell is using exactly the same form factor, is the one that is being worked on uh, a lot here at Seneca uh, through Chris Tyler's program, because it's an ARM processor. Um, so the ARM processor, uh, it's really kind of neat. You turn on this little guy and you hit the frame button and it tells you you've got about two and a half hours of battery left. And on this guy, when you do it, and it does the battery test, and it's the same battery, it's the same EC, it's seven and a half hours of battery. Okay. The uh, thing uh, that one will also notice about this particular thing is, and I'll power it up, is that this is a, what's called a trans-reflective screen. And it's developed by a woman out of, uh, who now lives in Taiwan, I guess, a company called Pixel Chi. And for those of you who are real geeks, you will have, uh, wanted to have a Notion Inc. Atom tablet. <laughs> that was, was going to be the god of all Android tablets. Well, unfortunately, they got into supply problems and they couldn't do it. But Pixel Chi was the screen that, would, that they picked to do it. And this is a screen that you can actually read in direct sunlight. Like, I'm not, not like a little Kindle, not like some of the other things. This is the more sunlight, the better. Because it, it uses a, what's called trans-reflective technology. So it's like a 1280 by 600 screen. But it's th it uses three pixels as opposed to one pixel with three colors. So when you go into shades of gray, black and white, it actually is 3,000 across by 600. So it, get, it gets into a really, really neat thing. So if, uh, oops, that's the gnome um, <laughs> on that side. If you wanted to go over to the, to the window, like it folds down like a little, little e-reader um, and just show it on the, help yourself a little later to see that on, on the sunlight. You'll see that that. I run the kids working outside behind you. Yeah. So you can see this is bright. Uh, this is midday uh, at the equator, uh, very high up. So the sun is just blinding. And they're uh, just the grade six class, their first day. And they were happy working outside. Um, the current OS that's uh, running on this is, is Fedora. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is that it, it, they just keep on. It, it's a lot easier to get new stuff in. <laughs> uh, getting it pushed upstream and getting included in Fedora as opposed to some of the other distributions, um, they just seem to be more willing to take stuff. I don't know, technically, I'm not going to say anything better about Ubuntu or Fedora or Red Hat or whatever, but these guys, for our deployments and for the OLPC package as a whole, they, they've gone to Fedora. So the Seneca side here is that ARM is not a supported architecture for Fedora. So they're starting from scratch. And they have this big Koji farm thing that they, they put all their RPMs through and then recompile them and, uh, for ARM 5 and ARM 7 and, and away we go. So this is all, this guy, 175 is all on ARM. More gadgets. We t uh, talked about gadgets. Again, these ones really, really work. These are the Vernier sensors. Vernier is actually, the, the David Vernier is a real person. It's sort of like the Bruno's commercial, right? Uh, and, and he's out of Kitchener. Uh, and he manufactures all these things and has all, all the software to do the sensor readings. Um, he developed um, 
for uh, the EPC and the OLPC, so that, that halfway between free and open source? <laughs> Here it is, you can have it. It's free as in no cost, as in free beer, but we're not giving you source code. So, it, and it all sort of, it, it was a mix of um, kernel space and user space. So we had little problems and the drivers had been kicked out by the kernel guys because it uses an old, I'm sorry if I'm boring you with the tech issue. <laughs> the, uh, the LD USB has been moved. It, it, it's no longer considered a, a, a kernel um, protocol and it's been moved out to UDEV. So the problem is that the software that they had developed for the OLPC wanted it to be a, a, a .ko. So it, it loaded in kernel space. So we talked to Mr. Daniel Drake and he said, ah, I'm in charge. Back it goes. So not only is it not a, not a .ko anymore, it's actually in the kernel. So he said, that's fine. Now the UDEV guys are really pissed at him, but that's another story. <coughs> so these really work well. Unfortunately, they will not ever work on the arm. And sorry, what are they? This is a, this is a motion sensor, sorry. This, this is a, a little USB powered motion sensor. So it's those little Doppler back and forth. Um, this is a, uh, a temperature sensor, so you can, it measures temperature, you can do all that kind of stuff and it all gets re read on the machines. Uh, our little uh, microscope here as well and these all, this runs on, on, on UVC drivers. So this is a different driver that needed to be there so we had to do our own vendor tables for the USB in order to get this thing to be recognized and loaded. Uh, this little guy, the projector, which is up here actually uses another protocol, which is SIS USB. <laughs> uh, and of course, when we added the SIS USB over top of the LD USB, they raced. So neither one of them would load. So then we had to, again, go to the community and say, we need to have EHCI loaded first, and then UHCI, and then SIS UB, and all that kind of stuff. Boring the hell out of Mark at the back. He didn't really care. <laughs> he just wanted it to work. One of the things about this deployment, though, that is really kind of neat is the whole aspect of cross-curriculum. That what we wanted to be able to do is we wanted to be able to have, do all these science experiments. And these are not like maker shed lemon battery things. These are like true curriculum things. They would shoot those up to Google Docs. And then Upper Canada College students in the physics lab and the biology lab would download their stuff and compare. So we'd have microscopes of, of cedar trees in Kenya and microscopes of cedar trees in Canada. They would share the curriculum back and forth. Um, so thank God for Google Box. Um, we we're kind of happy with them. Uh, what else do we have here um, that I wanted to talk about? Really, the, the technology um, is, uses, <laughs> Mark, Mark's going to be giggling at the back there. There's a whole other side to the machine besides GNOME, <laughs> and it's called sugar. And the way one gets into the sugar um, side of it, and it's a children's learning environment. And uh, so you just like double click on the little icon here for sugar. Sorry, this one actually is the 175, still doesn't have the SIS USB driver, so I can't hook it up for the projector. Uh, and it goes over to the sugar side, and the sugar is an activity wheel. Um, and again, you can, you're welcome to come up and take a look at that later. It comes up and it has a wheel full of children's activities, learning activities. And they've all been written by people who are evangelists on active learning and learning, learning and constructivism and constructionism. And they have all these things that they want to accomplish. And as again, for my role, it was just make it available. I, I know barrier to uh, what it is that they want to accomplish. Uh, if, if this person wanted to go out and design a bomb, that, that, that wasn't you know, sort of the old, I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like the guys in, uh, in Palo Alto, right? Like I just give you the technology, you do what you want with it. Um, but they... <laughs> I'm just trying to see if I can get that. Uh, can you get this up? The one thing I should mention while Kevin works on this, um, this is Sugar, the software. Um, there we go. And uh, there it is there. Oh, sorry, that's not Sugar. I've got it on here. Sugar Labs. Um, there we go. Sorry, let me black you out here. Uh, all right. Can you, uh, I'm black on the screen. Can you, uh, 
There's a button there for um, the touch panel to uh, uh, freeze the screen. Okay. Uh, okay, so it's blue instead of black. But this is, the, this is the normal wheel that the kids would see when they bring up the machine. And so it's a, sort of like a dual boot environment, except it's not really a dual boot. It's, all, it's still all running Fedora 14. And it's just instead of GNOME as the, as the UI, it's Sugar as the UI. Sugar runs not just on the OLPC. You can get Sugar on a stick by, if you go off to Sugar Labs and it runs on, runs on my Mac. It runs in VirtualBox on a Mac. It runs on VMware on a Windows machine. It runs on a Fedora 14 or whatever. Um, so that's, uh, what activity should I pick here? Uh, I don't know, Tam Tam Drum? Oh, Maze. Oops. We're losing our screen. Well, that's because you shut down the projector. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this is, this is a little game that we the, the kids start off with. It's just a maze game, and they they get used to the fact. Like uh, as as Mark has wanted to say, they, none of these kids have ever seen a computer before. None of these kids have ever seen keyboards before. If you really want to confuse a Kenyan child, refer to the trackpad as a mouse. <laughs> what? <laughs> Why is it a mouse? They've never seen a mouse before. So it's trackpad pointer. And you, you and sort of all feel a little like you know Bill Buxton from uh, Microsoft about you know, like would these metaphors are unfit for human consumption and like mouse is one of those things, so the the, the pointer does that. Um, can we show how the multiple one of the cool things is you can play two people at once and then three people at once, depending on the keys. So Kevin, which one are you? I'm not doing anything. <laughs> this is user stuff. So, uh, so, so I can start playing with this button, and then a second user can start playing with this button, and then a third user can start playing with this button. This is quite a simple maze, but within, literally within 20 minutes, a kids who've never seen a computer, never touched one before, were at the most sophisticated level of maze playing, and I lost to them. They're very good. So they, they learn the interface incredibly quickly. From, uh, okay, from, from the, some of the more technical things that, and within the, within the open source community, um, we, we get new builds of the software from, that, that come downstream from uh, one laptop per child organization. Uh, they come down probably about every three weeks. So what we've got is, the because I am who I am, I have a test plan and I have my 45 things that I test. So I get a new build, I install it on our Nexo 1, install it on our Nexo 1.5, install it on a 1.75, test my microscope, test my, and then I do all that test stuff and then throw it back up to the community. Um, that's what makes things work um, because there's another 15 people out there and instead of checking microscopes, batteries, solar panels, um, discharge, are we getting close? Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, we, we, they check the activities. They check that stuff. Anyway, um, I'm done. I can, I, I, I can talk forever, but uh, that's why I'm not a professional presenter. <laughs> okay, I, I hope you, go, thanks. Uh, the website to go to, to, if you're interested in the One Laptop Per Child program, is called laptop.org. Uh, it's all it's all wiki. It's all open source stuff. You can download the all the software. The uh, the builds are there. Uh, if anybody uh, wants to send uh, uh, emails, Mark has cards to us specifically. If you're interested in the program, they have something called the contributors program, where uh, laptops are provided to people who are doing development within the community. All right. So if you're interested in, in helping out, let us know. We're always looking for people. Thanks again. Thank you very much. Thanks. On behalf of um
FSOSS, I wanted to give you guys a little gift. I got one more. Thank I'll you. get another one for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get one for each of you. But um, thank you. But thanks a lot for coming. Thank you. Thanks really a lot. Great.